At the present time we are studying the truth contained in the revelation of Jesus as the last Adam. In our previous study we saw that this is one main title of Jesus, the last Adam or the son of man, the son of Adam, and that by the will of God and by his own choice he deliberately became identified in every respect with the Adamic race. He took not upon him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. He became a direct lineal descendant of Abraham and through Abraham of Adam. He became our kinsman redeemer, the one who came to take our nature and to take our place and to bear our judgment. And all this culminated on the cross. As is stated in Isaiah 53, 6, the Lord made to meet together upon him the iniquity of us all. Our rebellion and all its evil consequences were visited upon Jesus. Jesus, the Son of God, took upon himself all the evil due by justice to the sons of Adam, that in return the sons of Adam might receive all the good due by eternal right to Jesus as the Son of God. The cross was the place of exchange. Jesus took the evil that the believer might receive in return the good. We began in our previous study to examine certain aspects of this exchange and we're going to continue with this in the present study. In the previous study we dealt with four aspects. First of all, Jesus was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him. In other words, Jesus received the punishment due to our sinful acts that we might have peace, that is forgiveness and reconciliation. Secondly, the physical counterpart of that, Jesus bore our sicknesses and carried our pains and with his wounds healing was obtained for us. Jesus bore in his own body our pains and sicknesses that we might receive healing. And then we moved on to Isaiah 53.10 which is the climax of the atonement and we saw that the soul of Jesus was made sin as the sin offering with our sinfulness. And that Isaiah 53.10 is quoted by the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 5.21 in these words, God made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. The exchange is, Jesus took our sinfulness that we might have his righteousness. The fourth aspect we began to deal with but did not completely deal with, it is exactly parallel in the physical realm. Jesus was made sick with our sickfulness, that we might be made whole with his health. Isaiah 53.10 says there, It pleased the Lord to bruise him. Uh, he hath put him to grief, but the correct literal translation is, It was the will of God to bruise him unto sickness to make him sickness by bruising him. The same word is used in Micah 6.13. In the King James Version it's translated, I will make thee sick in smiting thee. Jesus was made sick with our sickfulness that we might be made whole with his health. There's another very, very vivid picture of this in the prophet Isaiah that we did not look at in the previous study. We'll glance at it for a moment now in Isaiah chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. Isaiah chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. This chapter, Isaiah is painting the sins and the rebelliousness of God's people Israel and warning them of the judgment that will come upon them. But in the midst of this, the Holy Spirit has included a picture of the atonement. But only in the light of New Testament can we see the reality of this. Isaiah 1, 5 says, Why should ye be stricken any more? ye will revolt more and more. The whole problem, is, as we've already said, is in the realm of rebellion. The will set in opposition to God. And then the results of rebellion are described in a very vivid, vivid figure from the human body. The whole head is sick and the whole heart faint. And this is a picture of Israel as God saw them, in spite of all their religion, their temple worship, their sacrifices, their nominal keeping of the law, he saw them as a totally corrupt uh, community or society. 
And I often think about this in connection with the Christian church. All our church going, all our hymn singing, all these things do not necessarily commend us one whit to God. Many, many times I think that when God looks upon the professing Christian church today, he sees it exactly as he saw Israel as recorded in Isaiah chapter 1. Remember, Israel thought they were the keepers of the law, they thought they were the people of God, they thought there was no one else like them, they were proud of their temple, proud of their religion, proud of their sacrifices, and it was something uh, very, very unacceptable to them to hear the judgment of God upon them in all their religiousness because their heart was not yielded to God. Inwardly, they were still rebels at heart. They were in revolt against Almighty God. And this, without a shadow of doubt, is true of millions of professing church-going Christians. They're still rebels at heart. And this is how God paints rebellion and its consequences and how he sees it spiritually. The whole head is sick, the whole heart faint. From the sole of the foot, even unto the head, there is no soundness in it, but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. They have not been closed, neither bound up, neither mollified with ointment. And I remember one day reading that verse and thinking that's a picture of Israel as God saw them. It's a picture of man and his rebellion against God. And suddenly the Holy Spirit showed me, and something more, it's a picture of Jesus on the cross. Because Jesus became identified with all that evil and all that rebellion. Now you go through that picture again and you'll see every detail applies to the body of Jesus on the cross. The whole head is sick. The whole heart is faint. And then from the sole of the foot, even under the head, there is no soundness in it but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. Now that is an exact literal description of Jesus on the cross never let any pretty religious pictures deceive you he did not look pretty in fact in Isaiah 52 if you want to turn there for a moment keep your finger on Isaiah 1 in Isaiah 52 which is really the last three verses of Isaiah 52 are the introduction to Isaiah 53 and the two should really be read together Isaiah 52 verse 13 begins with the word behold it's introducing a person and the person is then called my servant and this person is Jesus behold my servant shall deal prudently he shall be exalted and extolled and be very high the rabbis teach exalted higher than Abraham extolled higher than Moses very high higher than the angels that's the rabbinic interpretation and it applies to Jesus. God hath highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every name. But notice now the astonishing contrast in the next verse. As many were astonished at the aghast. It's a very, very powerful word. They, they saw something that they simply could not bear to see. It was shocking. His visage was so marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of men. And one of the translations says he lost even the appearance of humanity. What they saw on the cross was a bruised, bleeding, mangled mass of putrefying flesh. Let's keep that in front of our eyes. Because in that truth lies physical healing. Just as real as the physical sufferings is the physical healing that is offered. And when you spiritualize the sufferings, you spiritualize away the physical healing too. And that's one of the things that's happened in the church. Then it says in the 15th verse of Isaiah 52, just to complete this little picture, so shall he sprinkle many nations, sprinkle them with his precious blood. And notice here is the gospel going to the Gentiles, because the word nations refers to Gentiles always. The kings shall shut their mouth at him. And uh, in the course of history, many, many kings and rulers of the Gentiles have acknowledged Jesus as their Savior and their Lord, while Israel's eyes still remain blinded. This is just to point out the absolute accuracy of this application. Turn back now to Isaiah 1, 5 and 6. Here's the same picture again. From the sole of the foot, even unto the head, there is no soundness. There was no soundness in him. With what purpose? That there might be perfect soundness in us. His name, through faith in his name, has given him the perfect soundness in the presence of you all. It's something that can be seen, can be verified, 
you can send him to the doctor and have an x-ray examination it stands every test this is the soundness that's made available to us because there was no soundness in the body of Jesus if you consider the different kinds of physical mistreatment that Jesus' body endured you realize this was a literal description they placed a crown of thorns on his head pressed the thorns in lacerated the scalp and caused the blood to stream down his head it would clot in his beard and mat there they plucked out the hair of his beard tore it out and left areas where the whole flesh was exposed and raw they struck him on the face with their fists and with rods and left great welts that bled they struck his back 39 times with the Roman lash and tore out the flesh and exposed even the muscles and the bone they bowed his whole body beneath the weight of a cross until he could no longer stand and then on the cross they drove the nails through his hands and through his feet and finally they plunged the spear into his side all this is literal and just as literal as the physical suffering is the physical healing that's available to God's people it was an exchange notice the what I would say the pathos of it these wounds have not been closed neither bound up now they're mollified with ointment he received no medical attention no dressing no ointment nothing and in that climate they quickly putrefied this is the picture of Jesus on the cross it's a real tragedy in my opinion that religious art has completely misrepresented this and turned it into something that's almost pretty it's incredibly horrible but it's the result of his identification with us in our sinfulness and in its consequences and I said in the previous study that because Jesus took our sickfulness God offers us his health this is the revealed will of God complete soundness perfect health stated there in the third epistle of John the second verse beloved I wish above all things that's a pretty intense wish isn't it what a good wish that thou mayest prosper financially be in health physically as thy soul prospers spiritually if that isn't good news I don't know what is but you see the gospel is good news and if you ever hear anything that isn't good news remember it's not the gospel lots of people go to church and hear something preached that is called the gospel but you look at their faces when they walk out and you know they haven't heard good news or if they heard it they didn't believe it but in many cases what's offered to us as the quote gospel unquote is anything but good news I think I told you but in a previous study but I feel I'll mention it again about a friend of ours whose wife at that whose husband at that time was a deacon in the Moody Bible Church in Chicago she became incurably sick with a kidney complaint went to every doctor that specialized in this they all said it's incurable so in her desperation she went to the Moody bookstore to find a book on healing and she said I've heard her say this herself she got 14 books on how to suffer but not one on how to be healed that's not good news see. that's not the gospel later she went to an Episcopal church what a thing for a for a good Bible believing fundamentalist to do and an Episcopal priest and Brother Winkler anointed her with oil in the name of the Lord and God instantly healed her she went back to the same Jewish atheistic professor and he acknowledged a miracle had taken place in her body that's good news that's the gospel never trade it in for anything second hand or less good than that let's remember God loves us and he treats us as sons and daughters his will for us is altogether good his will Paul says in Romans is good acceptable and perfect let's notice now parallel with the difference that we noticed last time between sins and sin exactly the same difference between sicknesses or diseases in the plural and sickness 
or sickfulness in the singular. Let's notice this in the book of Exodus, in the 15th chapter, verse 26. And I want you to compare this with Exodus 23, verse 25, because though they're both provisions of healing, they're different. Exodus 15, verse 26, If thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and will do that which is right in his sight, and will give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statutes, I will put none of these diseases upon thee which I have brought upon the Egyptians. You notice diseases in the plural. But now turn to Exodus 23, 25. It says, Ye shall serve the Lord your God, and he shall bless thy bread and thy water, and I will take sickness away from the midst of thee. I'll take the very nature of sickness away. Not diseases, but sickness, the very thing that's behind all disease I will take away from the midst of thee and in Deuteronomy 7 uh, verse 15 we have the double promise Deuteronomy 7 15 the Lord will take away from thee all sickness singular and will put none of the evil diseases of Egypt which thou knowest upon thee diseases plural see there is a double deliverance some people have the attitude, well, that was all right for Israel under the Old Covenant, but it doesn't apply for Christians under the New Covenant. But the Bible tells us that the New Covenant is a better covenant established upon better promises. As a matter of fact, the way some people present the Gospel, it would have been better to live under the law of Moses than under the Gospel. But after all, in 2 Corinthians 1.20, the Scripture says, All the promises of God in Christ are yea, and in Christ, amen, to the glory of God by us. So every promise in the Scripture is made available to the believer in Christ. We aren't living on the leftover crumbs from the law of Moses, nor are we living on a polite wish and hope for the millennium. We're living in the midst of God's abundant provision for his children right now. Now I want to go on to the fifth aspect of the exchange, which is stated there, number 5, Galatians 3, 13 and 14. Here is another clear example of direct exchange, the evil upon Jesus, that the good might come upon us. Galatians 3, 13 and 14. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. What is the exchange there? It's between what two things? Curse and blessing. Isn't that right? What was Jesus made? He was made a curse. That we might receive what? A blessing. Notice again, it's the clear, specific exchange. It's not vague, it's not blurred, it's absolutely precise. You see, under the law of Moses, it was ordained that if a man was executed and hanged on a tree, he was not to be left hanging on the tree all night, because he was a curse. And when Jesus was hung on the cross, this was a visible declaration to all Israel who knew the law, that Jesus was made a curse. You see, he hung between heaven and earth. Heaven couldn't receive him, and earth had rejected him. There was no place for him anywhere. He was put out because he was made a curse. He was made a curse for the broken law. If you look back in Galatians 3.10, it says, For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is every one that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. It's worth pausing on that for a moment. My purpose is not to deal with the place of the law in the life of the believer, but notice that if you come under the law and you begin to accept responsibility to keep any part of the law, you have to keep the whole law all the time. There is no question of keeping a little bit of the law every now and then. The Bible says if you come under the law and you don't keep the whole law all the time, you're under a curse. 
Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all the things which are written in this book of the law. It's not just the Ten Commandments. It's every single thing that's written in the book of the law. If you don't keep them when you're under them, you're under a curse. See how dangerous it is to get back under the law as a believer. Because automatically you put yourself under a curse unless you're going to do what Israel never could do, which is keep the whole law. But praise God, we're not under the law. We've escaped from the law through the death of Christ. But now, here we have the presentation of what Jesus did for those who had come under a curse through the breaking of God's law. He, made, he became that curse. He was made a curse. Now, the curse of the broken law is stated very fully, I mean, it, with a tremendous detail, in the book of Deuteronomy. And it is worthwhile to take a little time to look through this lengthy 28th chapter of the book of Deuteronomy. It has 68 verses. I do not intend to read to you all those verses, but I recommend you to take time to read them for yourself. Because some people have got some of them mixed up. Some people are calling a blessing what God calls a curse. And therefore they're enduring a curse when they should be enjoying the blessing. Uh, it's very clear. The Bible is specific. It's logical. It goes all the way through in exactly the same way. It never varies. It never changes. But many, many believers in Jesus Christ who believe that Christ was made a curse, that they might receive the blessing, are still hanging on to the curse. And sometimes their theology is so crooked that they're even calling the curse a blessing. Let's say this. If sickness is a blessing, why don't you cultivate it? Why go to the doctor to get rid of this blessing? And if it's the will of God, why fight against the will of God by asking the doctor to remove it? That's really wicked. Bad enough that you're fighting against the will of God, but fancy involving that innocent doctor in fighting against God's will on your behalf. How wicked you are. Be logical. If it's a blessing, well, wish it unto everybody. Don't be selfish. Pass it on. Communicate it. People don't really believe that. The only place where people talk so silly as that is in church. As soon as they get outside the church, they stop talking as silly as that. But unfortunately, the harm is done by them. Now, the Bible is absolutely clear. Sickness is one of many different aspects of the curse. Let's look for a moment. This is only one aspect. If you turn to Deuteronomy 28... In verse 1 it speaks about complete obedience. And in verse 2 it begins to list the results of complete obedience and it goes on through verse 13. And it's really so nice to read it that I think I'll take a moment or two to read it. All these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee. You see, you can't go so fast that you can escape from the blessings of God when you're obedient. Really this is the truth in actual fact. I've proved it in my own experience. When I'm walking in perfect harmony with the will of God, the blessings overtake me. I don't have to pray for them. I just, can't, I just wonder where they're coming from. No matter if I travel at 75, the blessings travel at 85, they catch me up. And it says in the 23rd Psalm, and every Christian believes the 23rd Psalm because that's the Good Shepherd Psalm, goodness and mercy shall follow thee all the days of thy life. They'll overtake you. They'll catch you up. If thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. Let's go on reading the blessings. Verse 3. Blessed shalt thou be in the city. Blessed shalt thou be in the field. Blessed shall be the fruit of thy body, thy ground, thy cattle, thy kine, thy sheep. Fruitfulness is the blessing. Blessed shall be thy basket and thy store. Blessed shalt thou be when thou comest in, and blessed shalt thou be when thou goest out. And the Lord says in Psalm 101, He'll preserve our going out and our coming in from this time forth even forevermore. Verse 7, The Lord shall cause thine enemies that rise up against thee to be smitten before thy face. No enemy will be able to stand before you. Verse 8, The Lord shall command the blessing upon thee in thy storehouses. Isn't that delightful? Not just grant it, but command it. If, the, if God commands it, it has to happen, see? It says in Psalm 33, verse 9, He spoke, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. So when God commands it, there's not a person, there's not a force that can take it away. 
in all, verse 8 going on, in all that thou settest thine hand unto, you will never do anything that isn't blessed. Isn't that something? Psalm 1 says, whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. And that's speaking about every believer that meets certain conditions. It's not speaking about some particular outstanding Old Testament character. It says, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. That doesn't leave any room for failure. Now I'm simple-minded enough to believe that. Verse 8, the second part, He shall bless thee in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Verse 9, The Lord shall establish thee an holy people unto himself. Holiness is part of the blessing of the Lord. Being set apart, not living in Egypt's territory, but living in another area where the flies and the darkness and the diseases cannot come. Verse 10, all the people of the earth shall see that thou art called by the name of the Lord and they shall be afraid of thee. And you know as Christians, we are called by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Everybody should see it pays to be a Christian. We should advertise the Lord by the way we live. We should make people jealous of what we've got. Paul said to the Gentile Christians, he said, I'm trying to stir you up to enjoy the blessings of God so that you might provoke to emulation my brethren the Jews. And I'll tell you, in 19 centuries, the Jews have seen very little to make them envious in the Christian church. It's just about time we began to demonstrate what God has done for us. Verse 11, The Lord shall make thee plenteous in goods, in the fruit of thy body, in the fruit of thy cattle. God's provision is plenty. It's not a bare sufficiency. Verse 12, The Lord shall open unto thee his good treasure. If that isn't delightful, I don't know what is. Verse 13, The Lord shall make thee the head and not the tail. There's a tremendous lot in there. You see, the head has the initiative. The tail just follows where the head goes. Now, I understand that God's people should have the initiative. We don't let circumstances dictate to us. We don't let the devil dictate to us. We don't let the world dictate to us. We make the decisions. One of the great purposes of my teaching these studies is to restore the initiative to the people of God. Because basically, by and large, most of God's people have lost the initiative. We make the decisions. The world turns around us. We're the center of God's purposes. Thou shalt decree a thing, and it shall be established unto thee. That's to be the head, not dragged around like the tail, wondering where you'll go next, and what will hit you next, and what direction trouble will come from next. That's to live like the tail. God says, don't be the tail, be the head. Thou shalt be above only, and thou shalt not be beneath. Somebody asked a believer in my presence, how are you doing? And he said, the answer was, under the circumstances, I'm not doing too badly. Well, the other believer said, what are you doing under the circumstances? Because <laughs> you should be above and not beneath. And that's the truth. But it all comes, if thou shalt hearken unto the commandments of the Lord thy God, and not go aside from any of the words which I command thee. I can say that I'm learning more and more to do what God says and not worry about what people think or the traditions of, ch of the church or the reactions of people. My safety is in obeying God and I'm perfectly safe when I do it.